Hi, everybody. This is Donna Frosser, Chief Clinical Officer at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. We're here to bring you another patient safety update today, and we're excited to have an interview today with Dr. Bob Heise, Medical Director of the Critical Care Medical Unit and Professor of Medicine at the University of, Me of Michigan Healthcare System. Uh, and today, what we're going to be talking with Dr. Heise about is reducing the incidence of central line associated bloodstream infections, otherwise known as CLABC. Welcome, Bob. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Donna. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got involved in the CLABSI work that you do? Well, as a medical director of an ICU, I'm responsible for the delivery of medical care on the physician side. And I was also involved at the state level here in Michigan with our, our um, hospital association, the Michigan Health and Hospital Association, uh, some years ago, more than 15 years ago. And we were, we were creating a, um, a toolkit for ICU quality improvement. And toolkits kind of sit on a shelf in a book and they don't really get to the bedside. But while I was in, in Lansing uh, for the meeting, uh, the vice president uh, of, of the Michigan Health and Hospital Association, Keystone Center for Patient Safety and Quality, a woman named Chris Social, inquired our group if we'd like to participate in this thing called a collaborative. And a, a physician named Peter Pronovost, who was uh, at Johns Hopkins, uh, was uh, going to interact with us in Michigan regarding a checklist for CLABSI insertion and maintenance. Um, that he had uh, uh, examined at Johns Hopkins, so on a small scale, single, single center kind of thing. And the idea was, could we roll this out to a larger entity? And Michigan seemed like a fertile ground for that. And I was excited about it. And I remember coming back to my hospital leadership and said, you know, we really want to do this thing and talking to my IC leadership saying, we're in, we're going to do this. And, um, and so it, it, it was a groundbreaking effort uh, led by Peter, as I said, and, uh, and Chris. And, and it, it was groundbreaking in a number of ways. Um, first of all, it was a implementation of the checklist, which became popular. Tul Gawande published a book called The Checklist Manifesto about a surgical checklist, but this was a, a line insertion checklist. So it was groundbreaking that way. It was groundbreaking in, in this notion of a collaborative, a bunch of hospitals getting together, all trying to, to uh, learn from each other, support one another, and, and achieve uh, results, and Clabsy being one of the major targets. And it was groundbreaking in a third way, which was results. And um, we had a paper published, my gosh, 14 years ago now in the New England Journal of Medicine, which was a, a statewide analysis of the pre versus post implementation of the central line checklist, where we reduced the median uh, CLABSI rate in the state to zero. So it was groundbreaking in that regard also for achieving results and for achieving like a zero defect kind of uh, phenomenon. So, it really um, changed the paradigm, if you will, uh, for um, uh, CLABSI uh, with the notion of zero defects being achievable. And, um, you know, I think to that point, a lot of people would, would always um, say, my patients are different, or, you know, they, they just the rules don't apply to me, right? Uh, but I think that uh, because of, of that work, collaborative started to be done nationwide, a lot of emphasis on CLABSI as a uh, achievable entity, the government picked up on this notion. I, I think they went too far and tried to extrapolate it to other entities where zero defects are not quite achievable. Delirium, for example, I'm not sure how to keep every last patient to become delirious. Clamsy as an entity where you could uh, improve things. And, and what happened over time, frankly, is that uh, people paid attention and Clamsy rates uh, nationwide really plummeted. So when you look at the benchmark and actual benchmarking, I mean, even if you improve your uh, rates significantly, the rest of the country improved as well. And so your percentile compared to comparators was, might still be mediocre, even though compared to your historic uh, results, you're doing phenomenally well. So uh, that, that was a big uh, entity and uh, we, we kept the collaborative going for many years and took on many other things, the ABC the EF bundle, um, which later became the ICU liberation bundle, um, a bunch of sepsis, a bunch of other things, but we always, held uh, Clabsy near and dear to our hearts because that was the master stroke, if you will. That was the thing that put Michigan's Keystone Center on the map. That's the thing that really um, uh, put collaboratives on the map. Um, that's the thing that changed the paradigm with regard to zero defects. Wow, that's great work. And, you know, those of us in the quality and safety space have been following that work for years. As you mentioned, it's been, you know, quite some time that we've been uh, advocating for Clabsy bundles and, and, um, and, and the checklist, the use of the checklist. So, uh, so my question to you, we've, we've done a lot of great work. We have reduced 
uh, errors significantly and, and infections significantly in patients with central lines, but we're not at zero. So can you tell us a little bit about why you think that is? Well, you know, a hospital like a 7-Eleven, it never closes, and yet people come and go, and, um, and, 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 you, and you have to uh, continue to uh, keep your eye on the ball and continue to do this work. It never, it never goes away. Um, so, you know, people come and are trained uh, and have to embrace the culture. And so, um, you know, I think part of the problems are that, uh, you know, collaboratives kind of were trendy and now they're not trendy anymore, you know, or, and people uh, were required to, um, to implement lots of things, lots of bundles and checklists. And I think that ultimately, and I know Peter uh, or, or, uh, would agree uh, with this, uh, Quite a bit. Wes Ely down at Van, at Van, at, uh, Van Abel, as well. That um, you, you know, it's a culture each strategy for lunch. So a lot of places now have to do these things. You know, and um, if you pay lip service uh, to them, you know, oh, we've got we've got a checklist. Of course we do. Or we've got a bundle. We've got this. We've got that. They know they have to do that. But unless you have the culture that animates them, uh, you're never going to um, succeed long term. And the culture has to be sustained because there's turnover. People. Um, move on and you have to maintain that culture. So um, I think a lot of places have these things on paper now. Uh, and that was the beauty of these collaboratives, you know, over the day we went from toolkits to meaningless, really, operationalized things at the bedside to cultural change. Part of the thing about Keystone that sometimes people have forgotten was the cultural change was also really probably the most important thing that happened. There was a guy named uh, Jay Brian Sexton who studied the cultural thing and I remember a Milbank quarterly article, you know, kind of uh, understanding Michigan or something was called. In other words, what the heck happened that really made this this collaborative work? It's it's not so easy, right? Cultural change and sustainability of cultural change is not that easy. Again, if you have people from the top down saying, "Well, you must do this," I don't doubt that people will superficially comply. Uh, but it, you, you know, the thing about Keystone also was it was bottom up, right? It was a cultural change that that made the results rather than someone saying, oh, you better have a checklist. You know, your hospital administrators and saying, oh, well, we better have a checklist. And that doesn't really get the job done. So it's all about, it, ultimately, it's all about culture. Absolutely. And that's something that we talk about a lot here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. You know, we'll, we'll never be successful in improving those population-specific medical errors if we don't first address that foundation of safety and reliability. So give us some, some uh, insight into what hospitals can do to, to maintain that culture of safety. Well, you know, I think there's, there's leadership, uh, which is important, and leading by example, which is important, and there's empowerment, uh, which is critically important as well. In other words, I mean, Peter used to have a great anecdote. He was great in front of a live crowd. His anecdote that he would say was, uh, would your most recently hired nurse feel comfortable telling their your most experienced senior doctor who's putting in the central line that broke sterile mirror precautions, stop, time out, you blew it, you got to start over again. And then the audience would, of course, uniformly laugh, kind of a nervous laugh, and he would say, what are you laughing about, right? And then, and then you kind of have that reality check, you know, well, yeah, what am I laughing about? Because after all, it's an unsafe event. Um, but, I, but I think it's an instructive anecdote, right? Uh, because empowerment is part of, the, part of it as well. And, and um, without that, um, you will not have the cultural uh, issues that you, that you want. You, want, you don't have the culture you need to succeed. So people have to feel invested. They have to feel seen and heard. Uh, they have to feel they're part of something important. If it's just mandated from on high and, they, and they're really checking a box uh, that they've got, they've got a bundle and they're superficially complying just to get the man off their case, you know, or whatever, it's, nothing's gonna happen. Um, so the positive cultural thing is, is you have to have hospital leadership support. We did it in Keystone. It's very important to have top-down hospital leadership engaged to empower the local people, right? So that's what it has to be, a little bit of letting go uh, to uh, trust your, your um, rank and file as well to, to do that. I think, I, think all, I mean, that's true, I think, everywhere, right? If you're building, Cars on the assembly line. I mean, you know, quality circles or whatever, and the totally quality management issue. So, um, people have to have skin in the game, I guess, and to have the cultural change. And but leadership, you need the leadership from above to support the people below that they that they and, and show that they're valued rather than they're just kind of, I don't know, just not worthwhile or something like that. I mean, every if 
a lot takes it takes a lot to get a hospital uh, going. You know, in the recent COVID pandemic, you know, I pointed out to um, some of my colleagues, I said, you know, the, the people cleaning these beds are critically important. I mean, they are. You know, I mean, people look right through them like they don't exist. Uh, but you know, try having a hospital function unless if if twenty percent of those guys are sick or they call in or whatever. You know, I mean, so it's a team effort and a lot of levels. I mean, I just use that as an example. But of course, nursing, pharmacists, respiratory therapists, I mean, all these people doing their tasks make it work, and they're all critically important. And you can't you can't just assume the doctor's going to walk in and um, and then um, you know pontificate and expect something something good to come of that without engagement and empowerment. Wow, that is so very well said. Thank you so much for joining us today. I know that uh, it, our network is going to be really happy to hear this information. And, you know, and I think it's, 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 uh, it's something that we've learned over the last 20 years. I think that, uh, that we have to really focus on this foundation. And it's probably going to take us another 10 to 20 years to get there. But folks like you are leading the pack. So thank you so much for everything that you're doing. My pleasure. Well, have a wonderful day, and we hope to have you back again. Okay, thanks a lot.